The 1930s and 40s was a turbulent time for the world. Colonization and expansionist policies were the order of the day. The Western powers started grouping themselves with countries of the same interests. Two groups eventually emerged, the Allies and the Axis. In line with the expansionist ambitions of many countries, Japan also started to expand their territories in the East. Meanwhile, Sarawak was ruled by the third Raja, Charles Wynerbrook. Taking note of the world political condition, there were preparations to face the war. In Kuching, air raid shelters were built along Peak Lane for the European community. Britain sent a battalion of the Punjabi regiment to Sarawak to beef up the defences. All these preparations were in vain. The Japanese army landed in Miri on 18th December 1941. One week later, on Christmas Eve, they marched into Kuching. Meanwhile in Cebu, on 26 December 1941, the resident of Cebu, Andrew McPherson, decided to make a run for it to Dutch Borneo and hopefully eventually to Australia. Sadly, his plans failed and all the European officers and their wives and children were massacred in Long Nawang in Dutch Borneo. Among them was a young brook officer by the name of Francis Lekin Mansell. He was only 34 then. Fortunately, his wife, who was a local lady, did not join him in the escape as she was at the last stage of pregnancy. Less than two weeks later, on 4th January 1942, his son Edward was born, a son that he had no opportunity to see. Actually, uh, when the Japanese landed in Miri, they, they, they knew that war is imminent, so they make a plan together with uh, Andrew McPherson, the, his boss, who was a resident of Cebu, and a group of 40 Europeans with some of the wife, they tried to escape to Australia. So they thought that uh, by going up the Rajan, the Bali, and onward to the Dutch garrison uh, in uh, Dutch Borneo, they can escape the Japanese. But they did not know that the Japanese came from the Mahakam River, from the other side, opposite side, and massacred them all. So they all buried in a mass grave. So no one survived? No, no one survived. All of them, including some of those Dutch uh, nationals who were there, all, all massacred. He was one of the Rajas officer, mm -hmm. so he was a postmaster. When I was born in Cebu, uh, my father left on the 26th of December and I was born on the 4th of January, just mm. a week later. And uh, that was the end of it. I never saw my father. Mm. And that branch of Edward's family remained unknown until 67 years later in 2009 when he reconnected with his English roots through his cousin Christopher Lucas due to the wonders of the internet era. From the maternal side, Edward's mother was Toshiko Kimura. She studied in St. Mary's School, Kuching, and later worked in the statistics department under the Brook government, where she got to know Francis and eventually married him in 1940. Toshiko had a Japanese father and a Bidayu mother. Her father, Hiroshi Kimura, came to Kuching in 1913 and settled in Kampung Kuap. He married Ijah Anak Sipate and acquired 100 acres of land under his wife's name to plant rubber trees and eventually turning it into a successful horticulture centre. He raised a family of five boys and three girls and his grandson Edward spent a great deal of time at his farm during childhood which inculcated his love for agriculture and nature that was to shape his career later. How would you describe your grandfather, Hiroshi Kimura, as a person? As a person, he was a very stern man, very stern man. And uh, sometimes uh, people of his generation, he doesn't tell you, he gives orders. And he doesn't speak to his children like most parents. He's, uh, he only speaks to them when there is uh, something important to do. 
and he never joked with them. Well, kind of Bushido, you know. <laughs> when the Japanese army occupied Sarawak, Kimura refused to cooperate with them, and in the process was slapped by the Japanese officers. He was loyal to Sarawak, and when the war ended, he was allowed to remain in Sarawak due to his good relationship with the locals and the Sarawak government. He went on to be so successful in his horticulture venture that the Kimora Citrus Farm became a very popular place to visit in Kuching. So what language did he use when he communicated with you? Yeah, we, he spoke uh, local Malay. Huh? Uh, not like Sarawak Malay, but uh, like Chinese Malay. Very fluent? Sort of, yes. Very fluent in a way. At that point of time, he started the farm and uh, many people visit his farm. And to, to these local people, they never see a big farm like that. Uh, oranges and things like this. He planted oranges, specialized in that. And many people came to see his farm and also uh, agriculture show he won a prize for the horticulture. Mm. So I, I suppose that he, he must have learned about horticulture in Japan, but he never said that. So in those days, uh, one of the attraction apart from Santubong was Kimura Farm, very famous. And he's got a thick visitor's book oh. for people to sign. Edward's mother later remarried and Ivan, Jonathan Saban, and bore him seven children. Jonathan held several jobs both in government and private sectors that took the family to stay in many towns in Sarawak. Eventually, he took up the job of a secretary in Lundu District Council until his retirement. So young Edward was moving house to house every few years following the family, giving him an insight of how Sarawak was in those tumultuous years, witnessing and feeling the moments through the Japanese occupation, the end of Brooks rule, the Australian military administration, British colonial period, and the formation of Malaysia certainly was really history in the making. You grew up living in several places, yeah. yeah from Kuching until Lawas, uh, Limbang, yeah, and all yeah. that, eh? and then uh, staying with several families as well, from the Kimora family to the yes. Branda family, yeah. and you even stayed in boarding school. Yeah. Yeah? So now, what and who has the greatest influence on your life? The boarding house. The boarding house. Yes. Why is that? Why is that? Because uh, at home I'm I'm being pampered, you know, mm. like. Uh, uh, you know, we we're not sure of ourselves. We're not uh, uh, not like be a man. So when you stay in the boarding house, you have to look after yourself with the boarding house stern, boarding house master. So that mixing with other senior senior boys, they also taught me how to to be a man, to be to be self confident. So the boarding house uh, life has actually uh, taught me how to grow. In a different way. Upon completing his Form 5, he started working in the Department of Agriculture, Sarawak, until his retirement in 1996. He went on to be a freelance tourist guide, winning several awards, like the best tourist guide in the state and national level, an outstanding park guide in the Sarawak Hornbill Tourism Award 2011 2012. He was also awarded the Pingat Perkhidmatan Terpuji and the Ahli Bintang Kenyalang from the Sarawak government. At the age of 80, he has no plans to slow down. Presently, he is a panel member of Sarawak Tourist Guides Association, a vocational training officer and speaker for the Sarawak Tourist Guides Association's Continuing Tourism Related Education Program. He has just published a book about his life and is selling like hotcakes. He has plans to publish several more books and he will continue to contribute to Sarawak through tourism activities. Truly a son of Sarawak. Thank you for watching this video. Hi, this is my book. Thank you very much for your support. And you will find many unique stories in this book.